Go in three, two, one. It's time for the Talent Talk Radio Show, brought to you by People G2, a nationwide leader in background checks and employment screening solutions. People G2 gives their clients access to the best human capital management and due diligence tools available. They are dedicated to helping their clients with all of their people-related decisions. To learn more, go to www.peopleg2.com. Talent Talk centers on the topics of talent recruitment and management, leadership development, company culture, and employee engagement. These are all timely topics for CEOs, entrepreneurs, HR professionals, and business leaders. We hope that as you tune in to listen each week, whether to the live broadcast or to the podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio, that you hear something you can take away that will help you grow and impact your career in a positive way. And now... Here's the host of the Talent Talk Radio Show, the founder and CEO of People G2, Chris Dyer. Hey, hey, welcome to Talent Talk. It's Tuesday. It's 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which means we are live, and I have two awesome people to talk to about talent and culture, and I think a little bit of remote work, one of my favorite things to talk about uh, as well today. So, you know, this show is all about getting stories and learning from incredible people who are doing incredible work. And for years, I used to talk to people and pull them aside at conferences and go to lunch with them and learn all these amazing things, but I was the only one who got to learn from them. So that's really why we invented this show, was to move that conversation into the limelight, into the public arena, and still have this great conversation that hopefully will give you something you can learn, something you can use back at your company, maybe a better strategy for that great employee or that difficult employee or whatever it may be to help you grow and be a better leader, a better person, and hopefully uh, more effective in everything that you're doing. So, uh, so many wonderful stories came out of the beginning of the first few years we did this show, and that went into my first book, The Power of Company Culture. And then, of course, the world changed, the pandemic hit, and I was fortunately already writing a book about remote work, but that became the focus of the show for quite a while. And um, so my next book, Remote Work, is also out, and you can buy those wherever you pick up your books online. Um, we are live every Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and we are just sort of maybe three or four episodes in. We, we are now streaming on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube. So if you'd like to watch us live... You can do that as well. In one of those places right now, you can see my guests live and you can interact with us, ask us questions, put in comments, or you can follow us on Twitter at PeopleG2 or follow that hashtag Talent Talk. Angela is there answering questions, putting in uh, comments, the best one-liners, links to profiles, links to books, all the important things that you might want to write down, but maybe you're listening in the car or you're on the treadmill or whatever it is you might be doing. You're too busy to write something down. We're putting all that down for you. I think we also put those into the LinkedIn feed as well. So connect with us there, connect with the guests there, and make sure to comment and ask questions. We'd love to keep the conversation going. All right, my guest today, I'm really excited to have uh, my first up, my, my good friend uh, who runs Operate Remote. Uh, she's a founder. She's a remote team expert. Uh, Shauna Morn, and for those of you that are phonetically um, challenged like I am, that's M-O-R-A-N, in case you wouldn't know how to spell that, because I wouldn't have, but maybe maybe the rest of you would, I don't know. And then after the commercial break, we'll bring in Jonathan Brill, Managing Director at Resilient Growth Partners and a board member at Frost and Sullivan. But let's go ahead and bring her in. Shauna, welcome to the show today. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about you? What's important for us to know for our conversation? You know, what, where, where do you kick butt? Where are you awesome? What, what does your company do? Tell us all the awesome stuff about you. Yeah. Yeah. So Operate Remote, essentially what we do is we b blend coaching and consulting and we specialize in working with remote teams. So we come across a, a whole host of different challenges and problems that they face. And I'm sure we're going to dive into it a little bit more um, in detail. So yeah, that's essentially what we do. We do training and coaching for leaders within organizations. We help HR build out remote first processes. Um, and uh, we help teams become more emotionally intelligent and self-aware in a remote environment. So we do a lot of different things, a lot of different kind of bespoke work. 
So what does being remote first mean? What does that mean to you as you're sort of making that part of the focus? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people say, well, we're employee first or we're, you know, uh, we're, we're sales first, or even customer service first. So what does being remote first really mean? Remote first to me, Chris, means that we are consciously aware of the experience that we're creating for our remote employees. And we are aware of the different touch points that we have with our employees. And I think this is a really important topic to bring up, especially now that many companies are moving to a hybrid environment. You know, that remote first, some people call it virtual by default. It really is around creating that inclusive environment. So it doesn't matter where you work from, how you choose to work, we're all going to have the same experience. So it's all going to be that level playing field. And there's so many reasons why that's important. You know, looking at a hybrid environment today, it's like if you don't create an inclusive level playing field for your remote employees, you know, what's going to happen down the road? The promotions are going to go to the people that are in the office that are getting FaceTime every day. You know, the remote employees are going to feel excluded. They're going to feel isolated. They're going to feel like they're not heard. In fact, it's the whole reason why I started on this journey myself is because I was a remote leader and employee in a hybrid environment. And I knew that it, it wasn't right. You know, it wasn't the most mm -hmm. effective way to learn. And that led me back down, you know, the research path around research and remote teams and what was, you know, the strategies, the processes, and ultimately the mindset that, you know, makes us, thrive in these environments because we can thrive and you know that too. Right. Yeah. And I always found if you're doing remote right, um, it's very clear about who your best people are and who should get promoted for very specific measurable reasons. Right. Um, whereas if you're kind of getting it wrong, which I think is true in traditional in the office settings as well, right. It's about who's brown nosing, who's, you know, it's politics and it's, you know, things that, don't matter that aren't important to having the right people in the right seats. So I know in, in your journey to become a remote team expert, I mean, what are some of the things that you think are important? What, what should companies be thinking about, you know, looking at when they are evaluating their people, if they're doing a great job or if they're, if they're leadership material, things like that. What is there, is there a different set of characteristics? Is there a different, you know, lens that we're looking at when we're talking about the remote worker? Yeah, you know, I think even when it comes to not only even promoting people, but hiring people, you know, we need to look at, at that skill set that's important. For me as a coach, as an accredited executive coach, I really look at the emotional intelligence piece. And emotional intelligence accounts for up to 25 to 45 percent of workplace performance. So what does that mean? It means how we are, how we see ourselves how aware we are of ourselves and then how we show up and build relationships in the world, essentially. That's what emotional intelligence is. And why I think emotional intelligence is so important is look at the issue we're having around burnout. Now, I'm not saying burnout is completely the issue of, you know, uh, employees. It's not. However, if we build a level of self-awareness that's included in emotional intelligence so that we can really understand, you know, what are the best times of day that work for me? When doesn't work for me? What worked today? What didn't? Okay, so I'm aware that I had back-to-back -back meetings today. That didn't work. It sent my nervous system into overdrive. What do I need to do tomorrow to make a change? So it's that level of self-awareness that a lot of people need to build in a remote environment because you are primarily working alone on your own and you should have that level of flexibility over your calendar. So to me, when we're hiring people, it's assessing for that, not just have you remote experience, but how do you manage a busy environment in a remote setting? You know, what are the best practices that you have? How do you set yourself up for success every day? How do you manage your mental health? How do you look after yourself? Um, how do you promote that on your team? How do you lead by example as a leader? You know, these are all important questions to have. You know, what are the behaviors that we're actively living every day? And then those behaviors can be customized, of course, to the likes of your culture within your team, right? So not just a value, which might be respect. It could be what are the behaviors that indicate we are living by the example of respect. So yeah. it's about activating it, if, if that makes sense. No, it, it really does. And I think there's some very traditional things that we think about that companies might struggle with when, uh, you know, looking for people who have that good emotional intelligence, which is honestly a, 
a good characteristic regardless of their working situation, right? So we're all looking for those kind of great people. Um, but, you know, how we meet and are we doing too many one-on-one -on -one meetings? Um, you know, are we, how do we work asynchronously if that's a part of your structure? I mean, there's some, probably a very long list of things, but what are some of the challenges you tend to focus on as a, maybe a starting point uh, for your companies, uh, your, your clients that, you know, when they're getting that remote work really set up correctly? Yeah, the big thing now, Chris, really is, you know, a lot of the companies I'm working with are moving into a hybrid model. And, you know, for example, with, with one particular company, I worked with recently, you know, they asked me to come in and do some training for their, their team leadership team around hybrid best practices. But of course, you and I know that if they haven't established what those best practices are, then, you know, it really isn't the most effective. So in that case, it's around coming in, bringing a leadership team together, educating them on what does hybrid mean? What are the risks of hybrid? You know, where can we potentially go wrong with hybrid, but where can we really go right if we double down? What are some other companies that have done it well? What does that look like? I'm bringing that team together to say, okay, based on everything that we have learned today, what will work for our team? What are those best practices? What is that guide that we should create? And that's working really well because it gives that foundation of which a team can build upon as they transition. Because look, there's going to be, as we transition maybe into hybrid, there's going to be, um, you know, a phase where we learn a lot. We're experimenting somewhat, but we have those kind of rules of engagement to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, support us and all of that. So that's one thing. The other thing I've been, I suppose that's come up a lot is, is the issue around burnout. You know, and I know you've seen this as well, Chris, you know, 70% of, of the workforce have experienced some level of burnout since the pandemic began. And, and that's research from Monster um, at the start of this year. And I think with burnout, you know, I was reading an article there, there that said, you know, companies are given a week off to employees to say, look, you know, get yourselves right. Don't feel burnout. We're giving you a, a, a week off, a company week off. And I think that's great. You know, it's all those things that we can do from a wellness perspective. But at the same time, it's putting a plaster over an issue that's happening. We need to understand the deeper reason behind why your team are burnt out. You know, is it, a, is it because their communication is ineffective? Is it because leaders aren't leading by example? Is it because hustle mentality is promoted within your organization? Is it because your employees haven't developed a high level of self-awareness yet? Or is it a combination of all of those things? Um, so what I would say is, you know, with those problems, it's really important we do both. You know, we give those wellness days, we, we run those incentives to try and help people, but you want people taking mental health weeks or days off out of inspiration, not desperation. Yeah, so I mean, you, how do we you, get a company? If you thought there? about it like as a, you know, if you were mad at your spouse and you just took a week off from your spouse, you're still going to come back and have the same dysfunctions and the same fights and the same problems. So if you don't go work on the relationship, right? If you don't go and do something intentional, a week is going to give you a week and you you feel a little bit better, but I mean, it's not going to solve the problem. And yeah. I, what, what I'm seeing is that people, yes, they are, some people are overworking. Some people are burnt out because they are overworking. That is true. And they haven't learned how to create those boundaries. They haven't, which I think companies can help them do. Companies haven't put in better boundaries to help people you know, not to feel like they have to work all the time or answer the boss back at 9 p.m. just because the boss happens to be working mm -hmm. at that time, right? But they are missing the social part. Mm. They're missing time with friends and family where they would normally fill up their cup, right, and feel better because of COVID, because they can't see some people or they can't be at as many groups and things. So I think that's a, a big challenge for organizations right now is they're not able to counter some of this like thing that's happening that's not under their control, right? Uh, p people might be lonely and how do you deal with that? Mm, yeah, it's, it's kind of, you know, an, a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. You mm -hmm. know, it's not normal remote working. And I think we've stressed that from the start, you know, remote experts that have done this for years. We've really said, this is not a normal remote working situation. But I think your point around boundaries you know, sometimes it's that employees don't know how to set boundaries, but sometimes there's a fear behind setting those boundaries as well. 
you know, and it's that fear within the organization that we really need to tap into. It's like, I, I, you know, I want to go on vacation, but if I go on vacation, then I will be seen as dot, dot, dot. So we need to reality test that because to your point around loneliness, what I call the remote rabbit hole, you know, we're sitting here on our own every day. As you said, we're not surrounded by our friends and our family. So we can't reality test our thoughts off anybody so that they can pull us up and say, I know that's not right. You know, mm -hmm. have you thought about it this way? So we go down the remote rabbit hole and, you know, you see this, I see this a lot with my one-to-one -one clients. You know, I've seen your leaders in calls that have misinterpreted something or have kind of gone down the rabbit hole and, you know, they're in floods of tears. They're very emotional. So, and again, you know, we have to ask ourselves how much of that is work and how much of that is what's going on in the world. You know, yeah. it's a combination of both. We have to be realistic about that too. Yeah. And, and, and really helping people connect in a, so what people can do in this situation, what companies I think can do is how can we help people in, that are in different groups, right? So the, I think the first mistake, and I don't know if you, you've seen this, is that if you think about employees as one group, that they're automatically going to mess it up because not every employee is the same, not every group of employees, and you can put them in all sorts of groups, generational groups, uh, home situation groups, geographical groups. I mean, there's so many different ways you can cut this up, but they're going to need different things based on those different groups. And that's at least one way we can start to personalize our response to our employees, personalize the experience that they have and be able to personalize I guess the outreach, right? The ability to help them. Uh, are you seeing more personalization as, as a strategy by companies or is that maybe something you're trying to help them with? Uh, be kind of curious what you're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I would say for the companies that have kind of committed to remote first and kind of invested in this all along over the last 18, 20 months or so, they now are really personalizing that experience for their team. However, there are still companies that are really struggling and, and that's too far ahead for them. You know, there's, there's too many problems there that they, they feel like that's too overwhelming. So it depends on where the company is at. But I think what can companies do right now? You know, number one is collect the data from your team. And this goes to what you said, Chris, around personalizing the experience. We can all think as leaders that we know the answers, but we don't. It's we have to collect the data from our team to understand what are their needs. And, you know, collecting that data, whether it's a survey, whether it's roundtable discussions, you know, whatever it is, collecting it on a consistent basis. So we know that anything that we change, anything that we create is going to resonate and work with the team. And also it gives the team a voice, which I think is incredibly important in, in these times. Um, the second thing is like we can't as an organization, we can't take responsibility for absolutely everything our employees feel. However, we can create the psychological safety for them and, you know, communicate, look, this is what we are working on. You know, we're working on creating more space in your calendar so that you can take more breaks. You know, we were working on training our, our leadership team on how to create psychological safety and how to coach people if they're struggling with time management or overwhelm. You know, these are the tangible things that we can work on. Um, we are creating, for those of you who are extroverted and want more face-to-face -face time, you know, we are creating these social uh, activities. For those of you who are, who are more introverted, we're creating more deep space, deep talk time without interruptions. You know, so I think that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing around those personal experiences, yeah. Yeah, and you know, in your response that you were mentioning something about, you know, not have, we don't have to deal with necessarily every emotion that our employees have or having to feel that responsibility. And it kind of reminded me of a really important lesson that I had to learn back when we went fully remote in 2009, which was I thought I had to be the person to help all of my employees through whatever thing that they were going through. And then I remember, or I had this experience where I had someone come to me with a very specific problem that I had no business advising them on. Right. This was a woman who was a single, who was basically a single mom for a time because her partner, uh, her, her wife was away in the military for different times of the year. And so she would go from having normal, you know, two parent home help to 
now my now my spouse is on the other side of the world in a combat zone and I'm all alone. And so I was like, well, I've never had kids that young. I've never had that situation. I'm also not a woman. And like I went through like the list and I was like, I would be guessing at best, I would be guessing how to help you. Mm-hmm. And instead we went and got a group of people together. We asked, could anyone who thinks they might be able to help? And there were people who had some shared experiences with her and that group of people went and helped her with her issues and mm-hmm. were able to address her emotional needs and to be there for support and give good advice because I had no good advice. I had never done it. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Ask me how to ask me how to ride a giraffe. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And that's why one of the most powerful questions that you can ask as a leader is, you know, is that coaching question, you know, who do you think is the best to help you in this situation? Right. Right. Or what could potentially be your next step so you can find out more information about X. Right. And that's the power of the power of coaching, the power of getting our team to take responsibility for themselves. You know, if we move into fixer mode and trying to fix everything, then number one, we're going to be depleted and exhausted. And number two, you're never going to have resourceful employees. So, you know, that was a a big lesson for you and a a big lesson for all leaders that at some stage we have to learn. We cannot and we should not fix everybody's problems, you know, especially those empathetic leaders. You know, we have to really understand, are we moving into sweeping and fix everything Or are we staying in our own power and really helping somebody to develop themselves? Yeah, and it it really is huge. And I'm a big proponent for get four or five people together, right? Get get a group. Like four and five heads are better than one, right? Than trying to give someone support. I mean, this is why we have group therapy. This is why we have we have clubs and we have teams and we have all of these things in our as as humans, right? Groups of people are very comforting. They have lots of perspectives and ideas, and this is, I think at work sometimes we just get pigeonholed into, well, I'm your, I'm your manager, so I'm supposed to solve all your problems, and I got, an, I got my own problems, so I'm not really helping you, I'm not really dealing with it, or I don't have any gas in my tank to help you, and then we lose good people, um, mm-hmm. or we lose good managers, or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I did want to sort of ask you, uh, wh- where do you think remote is sort of headed? What If you could peer into that crystal ball. I'm sure you're hiding under the desk there. You know, where, where do you, where, what does it look like in the next year? And what do you think it looks like in maybe five years? Where, where do you mm. think we might, might, might see that go? I think it's a very exciting time for remote work. Um, and uh, we'll say that because, you know, we've experienced the benefits and we've seen the impact, the positive impact that remote working can bring if we don't resist it. If an organization commits to adapting So for those of us that are open to that change, you know, we're going in with a growth mindset. I think it's going to be incredibly exciting, incredibly exciting for organizations that can now open up their talent pool globally, you know, Um, for those organizations that have maybe struggled to access talent, you know, in their town, in their, in their village, in their city, you know, it's wide open. I think it's a very exciting time for employees as well, because now, and, and the great resignation of 2021 is an interesting time, you know, um, because it's on the employee side more than ever yeah. because they realized, hey, there's actually loads of companies everywhere hiring remotely for my exact CV. Yeah. So while this presents, you know, maybe a bit of fear for organizations that they might lose people, I think it's we need to look at it as a reframe and a chance for us all to level up create really amazing experiences remotely so i don't think it's going to go anywhere chris i think it's only going to grow but you know it'll be interesting to see those that are resisting it so 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 much how things will play out in the next year you know and how they will be left and it's like anything if we continue to resist something you know there's going to be there's going to be you know just more friction more challenges and then we're going to get left behind. So you don't want to get left behind. And now is the time to actually say, okay, look, this remote is always going to be a part of how we work, you know, and, and that's not going anywhere. So how do we make it work for us? And what are some of those steps that we can take? Um, and a lot of it has to do around the trust and the control. And, you know, we have to let go around a lot of that. We have to change our mindset, 
We have to well, change our belief system. You're hundred percent right. And this is why I always enjoy having a conversation with you and learning all what you're thinking about and what we can apply to, to our work and with our clients and our employees. Uh, one last question before we run off here. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? How can they find out more about you if they're interested in working with you? Yes, I would love that. You can feel free to add me on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn, Instagram, Operate Remote, or Shauna Morn. And uh, you can check out my website, www.operateremote.com. Fantastic. Well, Shauna, thank you so much for being our guest today. And I'd love to have you come back and we can keep talking about a remote probably until we're blue in the face. Uh, yeah. But uh, really appreciate you being here. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll be right back after this quick commercial break and bring in my second guest, Jonathan Brill. Imagine buying a newspaper and discovering that the news you're reading is six months old. There isn't much that stays the same for six months. And the same thing goes for background checks. In a time when so much outdated information is being passed around, it's good to know that People G2 offers something different. At People G2, we provide today's intelligence, not yesterday's news. Our value-added approach offers you a fully FCRA-compliant solution that includes up-to-the-minute information. By combining industry-leading technology with old-school human investigation, People G2 is able to give you information that is accurate right now, delivered quickly to our online system or integrated with your HR system. So ask yourself, are you comfortable working with old news or are you ready for a different kind of background check company? Visit PeopleG2.com or call 800-630-2880. That's 800-630-2880 or PeopleG2.com. Welcome back to the Talent Talk Radio Show. In case you missed my first guest, Shauna Morn. Uh, Morn, M-O-R-A-N. Kind of hard to say kind of, and read at the same time. But anyways, uh, you can check her out. We'll have her on the podcast after this. Uh, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you find us. You also can be watching us live right now on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, and on YouTube. So wherever you like to hang out, we're there. And uh, we're happy to uh, have you interact with us on Twitter and LinkedIn. We're in the comment section now. So let's go ahead and bring in my second guest, uh, who is uh, Jonathan Brill, public speaker, author, uh, innovation executive, managing director at Resilient Growth Partners, and a board member at Frost and Sullivan, so clearly someone who doesn't work very much, who just sits on the beach all day. It doesn't sound like you're very busy at all, but all right. Uh, Jonathan, welcome to the show today. How are you? Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. I appreciate, hey. appreciate being here. Fantastic. And your audio level now sounds great, so I'm glad we got that fixed in all of cool. 10 seconds cool. notice, so <laughs> way to go uh, under pressure. But uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? What is it you do? What's important for us to know about you and your work? Yeah, I help companies figure out how to survive and profit from radical change. I spent the better part of the last year writing a book called Rogue Waves. It's uh, up there. Um, and it's really about that question. You know, we're, we're moving into this world of greater volatility, and, and we think about uh, strategy, we think about innovation, we think about profitability in terms of this idea of compound growth, right? That we're going to do 6% better next year and 6% better the year after that. But in a world of compound volatility, like we've seen uh, in the face of COVID, like we saw in the face of 2008, it turns out that there's a different growth strategy that's often more effective, which is uh, trying to identify where that next wave is uh, likely to happen and use that compound volatility to grow on top of. And so if you take a look at what companies like uh, Amazon and Zoom have done over the last year, they weren't necessarily ready for uh, for COVID. They didn't have like a COVID playbook, but they were ready to take advantage of the opportunity. To, mm -hmm. they, they got hit by it like everybody else, but they were resilient and they took advantage. Uh, and this isn't just a thing that you know, Silicon Valley tech startups can do. This is a thing that uh, my friend's family farm in Ohio did too. They uh, had a, um, a vegetable business. They serviced 800 of the top 1,000 restaurants in the world. And when COVID came on the same day, all 800 of their clients just disappeared at the snap of a finger. That should kill most companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and they certainly shouldn't be thriving 
uh, through 2020 and 2021, but in 2020, they sold more vegetables uh, uh, than they did by weight than they did in 2019. Think about that. In the face of COVID, they did better. And what did they do? They had a back of pocket plan in case something like this happened where they could rapidly shift their organization to selling to consumers. Now they had didn't fully develop this in advance. It's not like they had uh, they'd spent millions of dollars preparing for for that COVID moment, but they did have an idea of the range of possible futures and how right. they would respond to them. How you know if their finances, their operations, their external environment, and their strategy changed or were impacted, how how they would be resilient. And that's really what the book is about. And that's what I help companies do. And that's, I love that story. And, you know, I, I noticed in sort of as COVID was, was going on, there was, you know, obviously restaurants were closed and then they were like, you know, limited. And, and I would go into some of these restaurants when it was like some of the limited times and we could go in and some were thriving, some went out of business, some were, you could tell, barely hanging on. And I'm, I, I was sort of asking the question, what's the difference here, right? And I remember one restaurant, they were like, we have never made more money. We have never mm-hmm. done better. During, mm-hmm. during than during COVID, mm-hmm. and I and I was I said why? Like, well, we went and signed up with every single delivery service. We contacted mm-hmm. every single person in our community. We were calling people. We were putting notices yeah. in their mailboxes. We told them, got the word out. We're doing delivery. You can still right. have our great food, um, and support local business. But you got to order. Here's here's the new way to get what you need, yeah. right? And other restaurants went out of business, and it was like it's crazy. Yeah, and and I think part of it's uh, where, where are you based, Chris? I'm in Orange County, California. Okay, yeah, so so you have some good population density there. It's still pretty sure. pretty open, but you have some density. That that makes sense. Uh, that that delivery play uh, really worked. Also, in a lot of cases, what we've seen is the development of ghost kitchens. Literally, these yeah. uh, organizations in very low rent areas that you can outsource your recipes and your production to, and uh, so you don't actually need to be a, a restaurant anymore to to run yeah. a restaurant, which is fascinating. My my buddies um, in San Francisco, in an area called the Castro, they they rented a second floor uh, of a, of an old Victorian building and turned it into a restaurant like this. And as the, these kind of delivery companies came you know they were growing a hundred percent every 12 or 18 months for for years yeah and it was it was that that ability to think about shifting the business model as the environment changes and having that be a part of your plan as opposed to a reaction to the future right like uh, I, I think about the you know in france uh, after world war one the germans invaded france and uh Maginot, who was the defense minister at the time, he said, okay, this isn't going to happen again. We're going to build a giant berm, a 280-mile-long fortress across the German border to protect ourselves. The Germans in the intervening, you know, couple of decades, they uh, they built technologies that allowed them to go through different different parts of the terrain. And when World War II happened, they conquered France in about 14 days. Right. Tanks and just planes give, can go around walls real easily, right? <laughs> tank, tanks and planes can go around walls, but but even more importantly, like simple things like uh, being able to bridge over rivers more effectively mm. allowed those tanks to move over those rivers. Right. Uh, new radio technologies allowed communications in different ways. So these things that aren't huge, right, that aren't like building tank battalions are really what made the difference. The point is that Oftentimes we think about innovation and change and all of this stuff as being incredibly expensive and and reinventing the platforms of our organizations. I think it's actually thinking about how we put little wedges and nudges into our organizations that make us more flexible when those moments come. Like sometimes you have to make the big bets, but oftentimes it's it's a bunch of little things. If you take a look, we were talking about the Maginot line, you know, that was 280 miles. Uh, the cost of it, they could have, for the cost of it, they could have literally put a tank every 300 feet across the German border. 
Right, which might have been a little more move, effective. And then move them. I think it would, you know, I think it might have been more effective. It, it would have been more penetrable in any one place, but it would have been more flexible. And yeah. I think that's the balance, right? Yeah, and and it's how you think about challenges. And I, you know, I think someone listening today might might say, well, geez, we could have never predicted COVID. We could have never predicted that much change uh, in in such a short period of time. Um, Why? You know, well, I'm just I, I'm I'm being devil's advocate here. Maybe they would say I couldn't have predicted that and come up with a plan, and and I could say fine, maybe you can't predict it, but isn't it about being flexible? Isn't it about saying, okay, here's my new reality. How do I adapt to this? How do I figure out how to be successful? Because again, in my restaurant example, some people figured it out. Some people figured out they just paid more money, they could get the workers they need. Right. Some people mm -hmm. were flexible in their mm -hmm. thinking and able to come up with a new way of doing it versus uh, uh, being rigid, right, or just trying to hold on until maybe it goes back to how it was. So, are, right. are you are you are you more into the, the we need to be flexible and, and and willing to make those changes, or is it or are you also sort of maybe more advocating for really planning that stuff out and really thinking about all of the different scenarios that might happen in your business and having some some idea of what you might do in that scenario. I, I think it's about both. One is understanding the range of possible futures. So first of all, this was a lot more predictable than many people imagined. Uh, eight of the 10 largest uh, publicly held companies in America failed to identify pandemics as a risk in their 2019 SDC uh, proxy disclosures, which is kind of where the government says you've got to actually lay out what the threats to your company are. Uh, at HP, where I was the global futurist, we'd identified it as a risk. And not only that, we'd uh, sketched out how we would move people uh, into remote work faster. Uh, we'd sketched out uh, the types of technologies. We'd been developing technologies specifically in case of a pandemic uh, that we could bring to market. Now, these yeah. were back-of-pocket strategies. These weren't like, you know, you're talking about a multi, multi-billion dollar company. These were back-of-pocket strategies, but they were in the consideration set. And so that's all I'm suggesting is instead of saying, hey, you know, how do we do 6% better this year? How do we do 6% better next year? I think the better question is what happens, you know, think about risk and opportunity from A to Z, right? What if you have an AMC year where you know you started 2020 thinking you had some nicks and nips and tucks, but had to do a good, had a good strategy, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're bankrupt. You take on a billion dollars, and your CEO says you still might go bankrupt, or you have a Zoom year where you know you have 26 times growth. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting about both of those things is is neither organization had imagined their future, and one was able to respond. Uh, and yeah. the other wasn't. Like, what's interesting to me about a company like uh, Amazon? Amazon didn't have a like a COVID playbook. Um, they happened to be pretty well positioned, but so were a lot of other players. Uh, yeah. What's fascinating to me is Am about Amazon is their retail business did ten times growth, or I'm sorry, ten years of growth in ninety days. Let me repeat that. They did 10 years of growth. They absorbed wow. 10 years of growth in 90 days. They had to hire a workforce the size of the Ford Motor Company. They didn't buy a Fortune 50 company. They built one. And yeah. so, and, and they don't pay that, very well. It's not like they're hiring the best of the best and giving out the best salaries either, right? I mean, they, <laughs> it's a pretty strong they, and hard they, thing to they, do. It's a pretty vicious yeah, it's, it's 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 a difficult problem. I th I think they pay a little better than than people like to say, um, but they do have a lot of transitory labor, and and they are very very hard on the labor. I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, the big point though is that they were able to absorb it, and you know if I gave your company, if I gave you all of the money, the best people all the technology you wanted, could your company absorb that opportunity if it came at you? Yeah, and, and, and right? I think the average company would probably say no. I mean, Amazon had some experience with seasonal surges, with ability to sure. handle larger amounts of orders at different periods of time. But to the sure. scale that you mentioned is completely I, almost un unimaginable. I mean, maybe we should. But to your point, though, eight out of 10 of those big companies didn't have that on their plan, right? 
and they, sure. they weren't thinking about it. So, but two did, right? Or two out of 10 did. And then you mentioned HP did. So right. what, what do so, organizations need to do to be, to, to have that as a part of their DNA, yeah, right? To, yeah. to be adapted to change. Yeah. So, so I think there are, within that, there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, um, when we think, I think there are two ways of thinking about uh, resilience. Um, the first is, you know, looking at the future. And I believe that you can uh, predict the future um, with relatively high reliability, just not within the range you might like. Like, Chris, you, you know, you look like maybe you're in your 40s. So I think in the next 50 years, there's a very, very good chance of you're dying, right. right? That's just not an acceptable range, right, for a business investment. <laughs> But we can predict the future, and and the the question, and a lot of what I do with companies, and the book is filled with processes for doing this, is shrinking that range so that you can actually make bets against the range of plausible futures, as opposed to like we're going to have flying cars and and everyone's going to have their own rocket ships, right? Like right. that's not a realistic future in the next decade. But there there are a whole range of things you might not. Uh, imagine. And, and that's what we talk about in the book. We did about $15 million of research over three years to figure out what those 10 major trends are uh, and, and talk about the skills and competencies. But one thing that might be interesting to your audience uh, that you can do uh, pretty easily is think about, are you ready for the past? Right? If you have uh, over the 20th century, there were 400 business shocks in the United States. That's about one and a quarter. And occasionally they overlapped to become unmanageable. So if you believe the world's moving faster today and it's getting more volatile, certainly your five-year plan should take care, you know, should be capable of responding to, you know, any 10 years of the 20th century, I would imagine. Yeah. So why don't you just go back and say, okay, well, if we just take the headlines from 1900 to 1910 or 1910 to 1920, are we ready for those things? Yeah, because we certainly, I, I, I said this a few times on the show, this was the first time in my my life where there was a big enough event that completely, you know, messed up my plans, that I couldn't just get on a plane and go where I wanted to go, and I couldn't just go do what I wanted to do, and yet my grandparents, right, went through the Depression and World War II, and like, you know, so they had things in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, maybe my parents could argue there was some things going on with the Vietnam, but maybe they couldn't go everywhere they wanted to go, right. but like they were relatively free. I mean, right. my whole life, I could go just about anywhere, maybe not North Korea, but I could go just about anywhere. And suddenly with COVID, right, it changed. But yeah. you're, I love the way looking backwards, if I had, could I, could my company, could I deal with things that have already happened if they were to right. repeat again? It's a really, really interesting way to think about it and not having to like, you know, be Notre Dame. I don't have to like have a crystal ball and say, I'm going to predict the future. No, I can look at the past and say, could I endure some of those things that may happen? It's a great way to put it. And then the, the next range of questions is what I call the ABCs of resilient growth, right? Uh, are your people aware of the range of possible futures, right? B, do you, so that's awareness. B, uh, behavior. Uh, do they have the skills to take advantage of it? Or have you just like take to take the wave analogy, uh, are they just aware of the tsunami coming and they're stuck on the beach, right? And then the third piece is culture, right? If you don't have a culture that encourages people to look outside of the organization uh, and build those skills to understand and exploit uh, and increase your resilience to change, um, then it doesn't matter that you've done the first two. Yeah. Right. Um, and I see a lot, I see a lot of this in organizations where we're going to have like the futurist come and talk uh, and inspire people. Uh, and that'll be the first day of our, our planning kickoff. And then we'll get to, you know, solving for this quarter. Uh, the second is that we see a lot of people like with our undergraduate uh, degrees or, or our early training, we, we, we track into ways to understand the future, right? If you, if you have a degree in English, the way you think about the future is going to be different than if you have a degree in social sciences, which is going to be different than if you have a degree in even mechanical engineering versus computer science, the, the way you think about the future and risk management is radically different. 
And so a lot of what we talk about in the book are those five uh, major ways of looking at the future, those skill sets. And how do you make sure that you have those on your team? And then how do you make sure that everyone has at least the pigeon, just just a, a couple of the words so that they can communicate uh, that they see that that wave on the horizon that the, that the iceberg's about to hit. Because the last thing you want to do is sit, end up in a situation like they had on the Titanic, where 90 minutes after the iceberg hits, most of the crew hasn't heard that it happened. Wow. Right? You don't want to be as a leader in that situation. Um, and so it's really important to have those skills within your organization. And, and that's, you know, that's a, probably two thirds of what the book's about. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's important you're talking about how do you find those people and I, you know, often it's measurement. You need to go back. I think it really make sure you understand who you have in your organization and what are their qualities, what are their abilities, what are their strengths. Uh, and then, then you need to say, well, geez, do we have gaps here? Right. Right. We have a great bunch of adaptable people, but we have no one that's thinking futuristically. Or we have a lot of, you know, problem solvers, but we don't really have any analytical thinkers or technical mm -hmm. expertise. Right. Or, right. And so where can we fill in the gaps? And that's often right. a really, I don't want to say easy, but a very effective way to mm -hmm. help your organization be more diverse, to be more diverse in thought, and to mm -hmm. help you prepare for what you're talking about, right? To have, do we have the people we need in place to? to deal with whatever may come and to help us plan for whatever may come and, and even predict what may come, um, it, which is a lot better than having a bunch of people who all think the same, look the same, act the same, saying, well, we're clearly all going this way and that may not be the best way to go, right? <laughs> well, and uh, ab absolutely, and I'd say two things. One, innately that diversity causes conflict. So in risk averse organizations, what you see is that you know, the change agents don't last very long. Right. Um, uh, and that like, if you have a, a company that started as a mechanical engineering company, right, all of a sudden, like all of the executives have undergraduate degrees in mechanical engineering, you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta break out of that mold and accept that what you're asking for is conflict, right? What you're asking for is tension and then figure out how to, build the communications methods within the organization that allow that tension to get relieved. The second thing that you, I think you really wanted to think about is how, uh, how as an organization do you create the, what, I, what at HP we call the future unit or the organ for this communication? Because what you really want is a core of highly skilled people, you know, that doesn't need to be big, uh, that, that understand how to really look at the future and the range of possible futures. That's able to directly access the C-suite, right? Able to access uh, the board of directors. Um, but then you've got people, you know, in the case of HP, all around the world, right? Who are who are sensors, who who have access to information, who who are looking at it from the perspective of the finance organization or the legal organization, or you know, go to market in Indonesia. <laughs> You know, yeah. And, yeah. and what you really want to do is is create a way to communicate this this understanding down, build those skills going down, but also figure out how you're going to pull that knowledge up. Because a lot of times, right, the 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 lookout, you know, doesn't have direct access to the captain, right? Yeah. Uh, and and the same thing with the captain. The captain doesn't necessarily know where to look in Botswana for for help. Um, and so, especially in matrix organizations, building these organs to, to communicate about the future and, and to plan more collaboratively is incredibly important. And that's really all about information flow, right? I mean, to your point, yeah. information has to flow down, it has to flow up, and, and good organizations seem to figure that out and have a good process for that. And, of course, that looks totally different if you're, you know, a, 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 maybe a vegetable farm uh in in you know somewhere in a rural area or your google i mean it looks very different but they're both extremely important that you have that ability to to move information up and down and side to side and allow innovation i guess to sort of percolate up right it's got to be able to get where it needs to go for organizations to do well uh, there's all the classic examples of kodak and blockbuster video and all of that where those things didn't happen right but I'm sure there's a lot of less famous versions of that same story where mm -hmm. somebody had the answer, someone had the key, 
to what was yeah. next and it just didn't get to the right person and and that business went away or well, people or, went away or whatever it may be or or that person and i think this is the the important thing or that person wasn't allowed to communicate that mm -hmm. or they didn't have the skills right you have to build executive judgment i think in a our more volatile world you know, lower in our organizations right executive yeah. communications lower in our organizations i am not saying that you know your intern should be as eloquent as your ceo what i'm saying is that there are simple tools um one of them is what i call lead that you can teach people at all levels that will allow them to when they see that iceberg but they don't quite know is some weird outline on the horizon i don't know what it is they haven't seen it before to communicate in a way that that it can go up the stack you know first yeah. is what's the logic right like what do i think is going on and why the second is empathy right like i'm the intern you're the ceo i don't really understand your job um but what i do understand is what i had what i learned when i was babysitting right and and uh so can you help me fill in what i might be missing about how i'm thinking about the situation the, the third is authority right like i'm i might not be the ceo ceo i might not have the positional authority but here's why i might be worth listening to in this case even if it's not the best answer you know it's an answer and it's the one that we've got at hand and then the last is uh, about deadline right how long do we have to respond right often you see this again and again in corporations right they don't price the cost of taking time to make a decision Mm -hmm. I'll just circle around for years and years and years <laughs> waiting. And then the future happens around them. Polaroid uh, being a great example where uh, the founder, uh, Edwin Land, uh, I believe it's Edwin Land, uh, decided he wanted to get into uh, fast processed, uh, like eight millimeter film. And so he built all of these things and these sprocketed mechanical assemblies and the chemistry. And as this happened, you know, Betamax and VHS happened. And so this thing that they'd spent seven or 10 years on was completely irrelevant because they'd spent too long developing it. Right. And that right. was a knowable issue at the time the decision was made. And by the way, just so you understand, uh, this fellow, Land, he was actually the guy who was the first documented person to say, hey, these, these, these digital camera things, I think they've got potential. He, he wrote a memo to, I believe, mm -hmm. the Department of Defense. And uh, my, my friend Safi Bacall talks really eloquently about this in, uh, in his book, Loon Shots. Um, but the point is, you, know, you need to actually think about how long do you have to respond, right? Not just what's out yeah. there. I've always said perfection is like, you know, the enemy of innovation. It just kill, you know, you, you can't be perfect, can't all be, you have to figure out how you can get to market quickly and test and, inter, and innovate and iterate. And for God's sakes, the first five iPhones I had completely sucked. Um, and yet I kept, I, they kept getting better and I kept buying them and my, and it was better than them coming out with the one I have now and waiting 10 years because Samsung probably would have killed them, right? Right. So. Well, uh, we're almost we're out of time here. This has been really fascinating. Um, but a real important question before we wrap up, how can people find out more about you, about your book, uh, connect with you? What's the best way for them to do that? Sounds great. Pick up Rogue Waves on, on Amazon. Uh, you can find me at Jonathan at JonathanBrill.com for advisory and speaking. Uh, and feel, please uh, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. I've got content coming out. Uh, pretty much constantly from Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Inc., Fast Company, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, love to hear from you. Fantastic. Jonathan, thank you so much for being such a great guest today. I definitely want to make sure we have you come back at some point so we can keep this conversation going because we had like another 15 more things we could have brought up <laughs> even just for today. So thank you so much, Chris. I really All appreciate right. it. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in and listening to today's show. Hopefully, you've gained something you, you can use in your own career in a positive way. Until next time, do what you love and show the world how talented you can be today. You've been listening to Talent Talk Radio, brought to you by People G2.